the ongoing OPI series of webinars that we've been offering for you for the last few months. Uh, previously, we've done OPI basics and OPI forms and fees. And those are both on the State Unit on Aging website, available for you to review anytime you need to. The one today is CAPS and Client Detail. And I'm very excited to have this one today. Um, we want to make sure that you know that the PowerPoints are usually right next to the link for the recorded webinar. So the PowerPoint should also be there for you to download and be able to use um, to take notes on as you go through this webinar. So with that, I want to turn this over to Mark Acuna, who has been really great to help us out for the last year or so with being our OPI expert. And he is going to walk you through the information today. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Suzanne. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Suzanne said, my name is Mark. So I'm going to be walking you through this training on OPI Module 3, which is the CAPS assessment. And we're also going to be covering client details at the end of the training. So I want to begin by just giving a little bit of background in case there might be a case manager who is new to ACCESS or to CAPS. ACCESS is the state program that is used for our assessments. It has an acronym, the Automated Computer Capture and Storage System. And then CAPS is really an acronym itself, the Client Assessment and Planning System. That is the assessment itself that we do for eligibility purposes. I want to talk to you about basic navigation. And I'm hoping that as you've opened Access and are now looking at Access and the toolbar, which is along the top, in order to begin a new CAPS assessment, we want to look for that book icon. And there's a picture of it right here on the PowerPoint. And if we click on the book icon, we are going to see a CAPS menu or a pop-up box that will come that will look just like the one you see on this page. And there are three parts to it. First of all, there's the assessment program then client details, and then lastly, service planning. Now, we're interested in beginning an assessment. So what we would want to do is to click on that CAPS book icon until this assessment uh, window pops up. And then we want to select assessments and click on that one, just as you see in the illustration. And then down at the bottom of that box, you'll see two buttons, one says next and the other says cancel. And we'll want to click on the next button. And that should take us to creating a new assessment. So once we um, click on the next button, you will see something that looks a little bit like this. It all depends upon whether or not the particular case that you're working on has had any previous assessments or not. If there have been no previous assessments, you won't need to worry about what you're seeing on the PowerPoint right now, because you won't see anything like this. It will take you directly to a page where you enter a date, which I'll show you later. But if there are previous assessments, you'll be taken to a list of those assessments, whether it's one assessment or more. And the way you'll want to begin a new assessment is to put your cursor directly over the word assessments, and then right click on that, and a new window should pop open. Now, this new window is going to look just like the one you see on the screen now. And it's only going to have one option, even though there are some other words in kind of light gray, but those have been disabled. But the word new is going to be black. And we want to click on the word new. And once we do that, that will bring us to the Create a New Assessment pop-up. And things are looking a little bit different now. Um, here, January of 2015, APD did an upgrade on the CAPS assessment. And if you've been doing some CAPS assessment 
in the past and you're looking at this training or this PowerPoint because things are looking a little bit different, this is one of the things that has an addition to it. You'll see here that we have a choice of creating a new assessment. Now for, for OPI purposes, we never use the bottom button, which is for state plan personal care. That is a different program. But we would always select the create a new assessment. And then over on the right hand side, there is a drop down list and we want to select OPI from that. But the thing that's new for us is that somewhere between those two buttons, we have something new and it's called copy and create from existing. So once you have pressed the button to create a new assessment and chosen OPI, if there is an existing OPI assessment, perhaps one that you've done and that you want to copy and then create a new assessment from, you would check the little box that says copy and create from existing. Now you don't need to do that. If you just want to go directly to a new assessment, you would not check that box, but you would just hit the word or the button that says next. So what we want to do is to remember that we have that choice of either copying or creating or not. And in this example here, we did not mark the checkbox, and we can click next. But if you decided that you did want to copy and create and you did mark the box, you're going to be taken to a new pop-up window, and this window is going to list the other OPI assessments that have taken place on the, this uh, case in the past. Now remember, you can only use the copy and create feature if there are other assessments. If there are no assessments, then there's nothing to copy, and you will have to create a CAPS assessment from scratch. But in this example, we see that there are three past assessments. Two of them are complete and one is incomplete. And in order for us to copy and create from one of the existing assessments, we would need to click on it and highlight it. And more than likely, if we do use the copy and create feature, we are going to copy the most recent OPI assessment. So on this slide, you will see that I have clicked on that top assessment. It will highlight itself blue. Now in CAPS and Access, whenever you click on a line, it does highlight in blue. So here I've selected a CAPS assessment. It has a date range to let us know what that previous assessment was dated. And then we're going to press the next at the bottom. Once we do that, there's another thing that's kind of new to us who are doing CAPS assessment, and that is that treatments now can also be copied from a previous assessment and placed into the new assessment that we're doing. So the next thing that's going to pop up for you is going to be a treatment window. Now in the example that I've given you here, there are no treatments listed. So if there are no treatments for you to copy, you know that you're just going to press the next button and it will take you to the beginning of an assessment. Now, if you do have treatments that you want to copy and to carry over to a new assessment, uh, there are some instructions for how to do this. You need to understand that in order to carry treatments from one assessment to another, you're going to have to individually select the treatments that are going to be copied and moved to the new assessment. You're going to have to give that treatment a new end date, and you're going to have to synchronize it with the mainframe in order for that treatment to be captured and placed in the new assessment. That process is a little bit involved and there are instructions for all the copy and create functions including copying treatments on a separate PowerPoint training which was done by APD in January of 2015. All AAAs were advised of this 
training and had the opportunity to sit in on it, but if you happen to have come on board after that period of time, the training PowerPoint is entitled EHCW Copy and Create. Now, EHCW stands for Enhanced Home Care Worker because the treatment part of this Copy and Create is something that's vital to a new program for home care workers that gives them an enhanced pay rate. We won't go into that, but that's the reason for the treatments being able to be copied and moved to another assessment. So we're hoping that we can get that training on the State Unit on Aging website. So look for it under its original title EHCW copy and create. Now, once you have pressed the next button from treatments, and probably the easiest thing to do if you think you're going to be confused by the copy feature for treatments is just ignore it. Don't copy any treatments. Just hit the next button, and it will bring you right here to this window or screen where we begin a new assessment. And those of you that have done OPI assessments before will be very familiar with this screen because this is how they all begin. So once you hit the next button, you're going to have the opportunity to enter an assessment date. And there's an arrow on this screen that is pointing to the place where you would enter that assessment date. Now, for the most part, an assessment date is the date that you actually did the face-to-face -face home visit with the client in their home. So we're going to enter that assessment date. And once we do, you will note that the valid until date will fill in. Now, that valid until date always fills in for the end of the same month and a year in advance. Notice also that below that, we have a review before date. That's going to be, that's also going to autofill, and it's also going to be a year in advance. It is possible to change that review date if you want this assessment to be shorter than an entire year and you anticipate for some reason that you want this assessment to end so that the access system can notify you that a new assessment will need to be done at some point in time between now and the date that you uh, placed in there. Uh, a reason that we might want to make maybe have an earlier assessment date is because somebody's health condition is temporary, and so our assessment is not going to reflect their true abilities come a year from now, and so we want to reassess them maybe at the midpoint during the year in order to capture those changes. But the thing that we are not able to do is to make the review date go beyond the year in the future. The system will not allow that. Now, if you do not enter an assessment date and try to go forward with the CAPS assessment, you're going to get an error message that tells you to please enter a valid assessment date before continuing. You get this message if you forget to put in a date, but you also get this message if you put in a date that doesn't make sense to the computer. For example, if you forget that we're now in 2015 and you put a date for a past year and it's past 30 days in the past, then the CAPS assessment system knows that that's not a valid date for a current assessment, and it will give you this error message. So just double check your date, put in an accurate assessment current date. Now, once we do that, we're going to begin to see on the left-hand side of the screen what we call the navigation tree. The navigation tree is something that we should navigate from top to bottom. And let me just 
as you look at this screen, point out some of the things that you will be seeing. Now, there at the top of this PowerPoint page, you see an arrow pointing to some ADLs that have a green check mark. That green check mark is an icon that lets you know you have completed those screens. So in this example, the person has completed mobility, ambulation, transfers, and eating. Now, whenever you see a blue arrow, as we see in this example, pointing to bladder, that's the current screen, the screen that is now open on the right-hand side. And it is for you to read and then come up with an answer to, to the assessment. The screens that are yet to be completed are yellow folders. Those yellow folders tell us that we have not yet addressed those topics, and we still need to do so. At the very bottom of the navigation tree, you're going to see two red Xs. Those are information screens, and the red X indicates that the assessment is not fully complete. When we complete all parts of the CAPS assessment on this navigation tree, then those red X's are going to turn green and give us the opportunity to complete the assessment. So if you forget a component of this navigation tree and you're still seeing those red X's but you think that you're finished with the CAPS assessment, then you've actually forgotten a component. Now, here's some tips. When we are using CAPS, we want to move from top to bottom and left to right when completing the fields and all of the screens in CAPS. If we move from top to bottom, it ensures that we take things one step at a time and we're not forgetting something. And then another tip is to try to enter your ADL and IADL comments at the same time that you make the appropriate selections to the assessment. And this is to avoid having an incomplete assessment screen. It is possible for you to answer the question or the statement and not make a comment. But CAPS rules and the Oregon administrative rules really tell us that we do need comments to substantiate our answers. And so it is incomplete if we have not entered a comment. And then a full assessment for OPI includes the four ADLs, uh, all the additional ADLs, and also all of the IADLs. At times, the assessment program will let you complete an assessment for four ADLs. But for OPI, you don't want to do that because only Title 19 allows case managers to do a 4ADL CAPS assessment, and that's for nursing homes only. So remember, for OPI, we want to complete all the ADLs and all the IADLs. Now, a little bit about the new CAPS. Each ADL, which is activities of daily living, and IADLs, which are incidental activities of daily living, are screens that contain a statement. The statements on the CAPS assessment come from the rules. So the Oregon Administrative Rules, Chapter 411, Division 15, and specifically um, 0006, which are the activities of daily living, and 0007, which are the instrumental activities of daily living, all come from the Oregon Administrative Rules. So every question and statement and, and answer comes from the rules. And if you wanted to look up the rules yourself, and I would encourage you to do so if you're new to case management for OPI so that you know the rules that govern activities of daily living and incidental activities of daily living. Now, the answers for each of the topics in the CAPS assessment are going to be chosen from multiple choice, alphabetical headings, A, B, C, or D, et cetera. And we're going to give you an example so that you can see this. Now, here we see one of the ADLs, which is toileting. 
And we see that there is a statement, and then there's also at the bottom of that statement some multiple choice answers or responses to that statement. So the statement says about toileting needs hands-on assistance from another person to accomplish one or more tasks of toileting with or without assistive devices. Toileting tasks include the following, getting to and from and on and off the toilet, including the bedpan, commode or urinal, cleansing after elimination or adjusting clothing, cleaning and maintaining assistive devices or cleaning the toileting area after elimination because of unsanitary conditions that would pose a health risk. The need must be greater than routine housekeeping. Hands-on assistance does not apply to these tasks. So notice that the toileting statement does have in big, bold letters hands-on and it's also underlined. What they've done in the CAPS assessment is stressed that the assistance levels that are demanded by the Oregon administrative rules are highlighted for us so that we can be sure when we're doing an assessment that the important uh, assist level is highlighted for us so we can be on the lookout for that. So when it comes to toileting, hands-on assistance is going to be the benchmark for us, not, for example, standby assistance or queuing, because that doesn't fit rule. And then after we see this statement, we see that we have a multiple choice responses. A is independent, which means that the person does not need hands-on assistance from another person for any part of toileting or B, at least monthly, needs assistance to accomplish some of the tasks of bowel care, and C is always needs assistance with toileting, and the assistance must include the tasks in the first two bullets. So notice that some of our responses are very specific about addressing some of the bullet points in the statement above. So be very careful when you're doing your assessment that you fully read the statement and that you completely understand the multiple choice answers that you're selecting. Now we have some help in understanding the toileting rules or any of the ADL rules and that's what we're going to look at next. You'll see before we get there that there's a scroll bar on the right hand side. Now, be sure to use the scroll bar because on this screen we can only see that there are three answers, A, B, and C. But we don't know if there is a fourth answer unless we use the scroll bar. When we get down to a solid line, that tells us that we have reached the end of the information. So in this example, there are only three responses, A, B, and C. And in order to select one of those responses, we're going to use the drop-down menu at the very bottom. And we're going to click on the arrow and select either A, B, or C. And choose the most appropriate response. Now, the help that I was talking about comes in the form of what we call a quick help header. Now, a header is that top portion of the ADL description, and in this slide that we're looking at at the moment, we happen to be looking at the transfer statement. And so the top header simply says transfers, and I have it surrounded by a red line. So what you would do in order to see the quick help header is to take the cursor of your mouth go over to transfer and click on it. Once you do, you're going to receive some more information. And I want to give you an example of that information. So what I've done in the next two slides is, is I have detailed for you what you would see in the quick help header if you were to look at the ambulation header. So here it tells us, and all of the quick help 
information comes from the Oregon Administrative Rules and specifically from the long-term care service rules found in Chapter 411, Division 15. So it says that ambulation means the activity of moving around both inside the home or care setting and outside during the assessment time frame while using assisted devices if needed. Ambulation does not include exercise or physical therapy. Now, here's an example of why the quick help header was useful to us because we didn't see this information in the statement or the answers, but it's in the rules and it's important for us to know. So we might have a client, for example, who only ambulates or is only on their feet when, when the physical therapist comes to the home once or twice a week to assist them in walking as a part of therapy and that might be hands-on assistance for walking and they might walk 12 feet in one direction and 12 feet back and that's going to be part of their therapy. Now, if that's the only time they ambulate but every other time they're either in bed or in a wheelchair, we're tempted to count that walking with hands-on assistance as part of the client's ambulation. But in rules, it specifically excludes exercise and physical therapy. So because this is physical therapy, we would not want to count that hands-on assistance that is given during therapy. Now let's go on reading the quick help header for ambulation. It also says that when you address mobility, which is ambulation and transfer in general, it does not include the following activities, getting in and out of a motor vehicle, getting in or out of the bathtub or shower, or on or off the toilet, or moving to or from the toilet. And the reason for this is because all of those mobility activities are covered under their separate topic. It also says that inside means inside the entrance to the individual's home or apartment unit or inside the care setting. And outside means outside the home or care setting, such as courtyards, balconies, stairs, and hallways. So if we said, for example, that the subject of our assessment needs hands-on assistance only to get up the front two steps of their home from street level and into the front door, we know that we have to count that assistance as outdoor or outside assistance not indoor, because it is outside the entrance to the individual's home. Okay, so let's go on and you'll see that the quick help header also has a scroll bar and at the bottom of all of the information for the quick help header, there's a solid line to let you know that there's no more information in the quick help header. Now, in order to escape the quick help and to get back to the assessment, we need to move our cursor over the header, which says, in this example, transfers. And once we click on it, it's going to take us back to the assessment statement. OK. So you'll want to read the quick help header. Uh, address the statement and use the multiple choice answers to select your answer for each and every topic that is on the navigation tree. Now, we are not going to be covering in this training each and every topic. Our purpose is to show you how to navigate the CATS assessment, but I encourage you to read the Oregon Administrative Rules if you need more details on interpreting the activities of daily living and the incidental activities of daily living. So notice on this slide that we have addressed mobility, ambulation, transfer, and eating. So we're moving at a from top to bottom, covering each and every topic not only answering the multiple choice questions, but also writing a comment 
to substantiate why we're answering the multiple choice questions the way we are. And we can also see from this example that we still have a ways to go. We have not yet finished dealing with all the elimination topics and also cognition or behavior. If you look a little bit farther down the tree, you're going to see that there's some additional ADL and IADL. But it only has one folder, and it has a little plus sign next to that folder. We want you to know that in order to complete the entire CAPS assessment, you need to either click with your mouse on that plus sign or double click on the folder, and it will open up new folders, which are new topics. So for example, when we click on the plus sign, in front of the folder that says additional ADL and IADLs, it's going to open up two uh, more folders. When we click on the plus sign for those two folders, they will both fully open up to expose the topics of bathing, personal hygiene, dressing, and grooming, and also the IADL topics of housekeeping, laundry, breakfast, lunch, dinner, medication management, shopping, and transportation. If you're not seeing these topics, it's because you have not opened the folder in order to fully see all of the topics that you need to deal with. Also, the sleep folder has a plus sign next to it, and it also needs to be opened fully so that you can fully answer the sleep topic. OK, now that you've seen how we can use those plus signs to open up the additional topics, I want to talk about sleep for a moment. And I'm getting my information from the Oregon Administrative Rules, Chapter 411-030-0070, and Number 4. And what it tells us about the sleep question, which is sometimes a little bit complicated for some people, it, it is simple if you read the rule. But the, or the consideration is, does the individual need assistance at unpredictable times throughout a 24-hour period, including nighttime, and requires assistance with ambulation or transfer? And can the provider get at least five continuous hours of sleep in an eight-hour period during a 24-hour uh, work period? So really what we want to know in that sleep statement is if the client would be um, stuck in bed without the ability to get out of bed and needs transfer or ambulation assistance, and a provider needs to get up and assist them during the night. So uh, if that's the case, we'll want to write a comment about the situation. We'll want to write how many times during the night a provider is required to get up and whether that provider can get at least five hours of continuous sleep. Now, for the most part, if a person only gets up once or even sometimes twice in the evening, once early in the evening and once very early in the morning, the provider can get at least five hours of sleep. But if somebody is getting up three or more times during the evening, then we should look closely at that because that probably means that the provider cannot get at least five continuous hours of sleep. So take a look at your sleep statement and answers for a full description of this topic. Okay. Now, one of the things that you will notice is that sometimes when we finish the four ADLs, if we click the next button, it's going to take us immediately to treatments. But if we go immediately to treatments, we have not covered the additional ADLs or IADLs or even the sleep question. So we may need to back up in order to open up those topics. But as you can tell by this example, there is a green check mark next to additional ADLs and IADLs. And there's also a green check mark next to sleep. So we have addressed 
all the topics because they're green. And right now we're at the treatment topic. Now, treatments are those uh, medical treatments that might require the additional assistance of a care provider for the person. And we want to try to be as complete as possible in describing those treatments. Now, if you are used to doing CAPS assessment, treatments are going to be looking a little bit different since the upgrade that took place here in January. Moving forward, we're going to see that the recent changes to CAPS treatments can really be fully described in the training which I mentioned earlier, a PowerPoint training entitled EHCW, which is Enhanced Home Care Worker Copy and Create, found on the State Unit on Aging website. When you go to the treatment uh, section, you're going to see a window that looks like this. Now, in order for you to add a treatment, now in this example, there are no treatments that have been added because the upper portion of this small blue window doesn't list any treatments. So to start a treatment, we want to enter in a start date and an end date for the treatment. We also want to look at the type and the description. But notice that you have two options for entering a start or end date. You can just type in the date in the white box. Or you can use the little calendar icon and use that icon to see an actual calendar and click on the calendar days for your start date or end date. Now the next thing that you'll see below that is going to be the treatment type and the treatment description. Now the treatments have not changed. They just look a little different than they used to look in the caps. Uh, screens. So what we see here is if we were to use the drop-down menu in this area where we see the word medication, we're going to have all of the normal treatment topics that we were used to seeing. Each of those topics is broken down into individual treatments and that's where the description comes into play. So in this example, under medication, Use the drop-down list to select routine, regularly scheduled medication. Also on that drop-down list are other things that we're used to seeing, such as insulin injections or topical treatments, etc. All right. So then underneath that, we see the frequency. And that also is a drop-down list, and we're going to use that drop-down list by clicking on the little arrow to select the number of times per day or per week or even month that a treatment is done for our client. Now notice that below that frequency box, we see the something that says sync status. This is brand new. We've never seen that before. This really talks about synchronization of the treatments with the mainframe. And in this case, this particular treatment is in pending because it says pend. Now, before I go forward, if you decide that you're on the wrong treatment type, wrong description or frequency, and you just want to start all over, just use the clear button, and the clear button will clear the screen so you can make your selections all over again. If you had an existing treatment that was on a list above this section, you could invalidate that treatment by clicking on it. It would become highlighted blue. And there you see next to the frequency line a little invalidate box. You would click on that invalidate box and that would invalidate the treatment that is in this area 
above in a list. This particular example doesn't have any treatments listed. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that synchronization to the mainframe. So I've kind of highlighted here that a part of these treatments, if we filled in the entire treatment, we have the date, we have the type, we have the frequency. Remember it says pending. We will press the sync MF button, which stands for synchronized to the mainframe. And that will begin the electronic process of our treatment that we've entered being carried over to the mainframe case for this particular person. To give you a little bit of background about this, the reason that we want to synchronize to the mainframe is because home care workers and their information are stored on the mainframe, and so is their payment system through the vouchers. If they are to get an enhanced rate because of complicated treatments for the client, we'll need the information from our CAPS assessment to be carried over to the mainframe so that the mainframe will recognize the treatments that they are doing for the client. That's the reason for the synchronization. So we would press the sync to mainframe button. And notice that if there's a successful synchronization, if it has gone to the mainframe and the information has been downloaded successfully, then the sync status will change from penned to pass. And our goal is that every treatment we enter will be synchronized to the mainframe one at a time and that those treatments will then go from pending to pass. Again, I will want to point out that this treatment feature is really trained in detail in that enhanced home care worker copy and create PowerPoint training that was provided by APD. Okay, so sometimes when you try to synchronize a treatment to the mainframe, Things are going a little bit slow, and there was not an immediate synchronization. If the computers are trying to reach across miles and connect with each other and think about what you've just done, sometimes we'll get a statement that says that our synchronization has been placed in a queue, and it's waiting for processing. So don't worry about that warning statement. That just simply says that we might have to wait a few moments before the synchronization actually happens. Now, we just simply click on the OK button, and we can go on to deal with other treatments or other parts of the assessment without actually waiting for it to synchronize to the mainframe. OK. So if you look here at the CAPS tree, right below sleep and treatments is a section of the CAPS tree we call supports. Supports is going to look exactly like what you see here on this PowerPoint slide. And the support screen is going to show in the white rows those areas of activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living that we have selected in our assessment that where the client needs assistance. So in this particular example, our assessment shows that the client needs assistance in ambulation, transfers, toileting, dressing, housekeeping, laundry, and shopping. Now the rest of the topics, which are in light blue, are topics where we indicated that perhaps the client was independent in those areas. Now, whenever we click on one of the white lines in the support screen, it's going to highlight blue. In this case, ambulation is highlighted blue and is one that we can now work with. Now, what we need to do is for each one of the white highlighted items that we selected in the assessment where our client needs assistance, we need to know whether or not 
that need is met or unmet or partially met and who is meeting the need. So let's look at, a, at an example. We're going to use the little drop-down list which you click on this little arrow right next to the need status or the provider status and by doing that we're going to get a selection. In this case, the case manager said that ambulation was partially met and the provider is a mix of paid and unpaid providers. Toileting is unmet and there is no provider. Also, dressing is met, but it's met by an unpaid provider. And usually an unpaid provider is someone we would consider to be a natural support, someone who's associated with the client and providing this service free of charge. So you want to move down the entire support screen indicating whether the need is met or unmet or partially met and whether the provider is a paid provider, unpaid, or a mix of both. Notice also on this screen we have a supports and contacts button. That identifies the person providing unpaid support. So if we were to look at, at that button, it would essentially show us who the natural supports are in, identified in the client's contact screen. Now in order to go beyond the support screen, we'll need to finish everything here and then click on the next button. That's going to take us down to the next topic, which is the synopsis. So the synopsis is a screen where we can capture information that is not captured in the CAPS assessment comment. We don't really want to duplicate information, so you don't need to type in this field information that you've already given us in the CAPS comments. We, um, that would be redundant, but perhaps information that is not captured there. So here's some examples of some things that you could put in the synopsis screen. We could put a general statement of the age or health or physical and mental status of the individual, recent events that might affect the individual's functioning. So for example, if the individual had recent falls that resulted in broken bones, then that would be something that would paint a picture for us of why needs are changing. Also important interests, motivators, family or other significant supports. So for example, this individual might have a lot of family members, but perhaps the daughter, which you will name in the synopsis, is the main family contact and is the person who has the most contact with the client and is the one to check with for important updates or information. And then we also can place any significant changes to anything that might have happened in the past. Also a quick summary of major issues and individual preferences or needs. So for example, the client might have a preference to only having a familiar caregiver and not using agencies or home care workers that would send uh, a home care worker that they don't know. And then a quick summary of the needs or planned services and other issues such as pets or smoking or substance abuse, etc. Just things that are not found in other places. Now, Take note of the fact that the synopsis is not mandatory. You don't have to fill in the synopsis, but it might be helpful both to yourself and to future CAPS assessments in order to have some information here that we don't find in any other location. Now, I do want to say one other thing about the synopsis, and that is the synopsis does not take the place of narration. Narration is something that you will find on the CAP uh, or Access toolbar at the top. It's a series of pages. 
narration should be ongoing. You should narrate things such as each home visit, the results of an assessment, all communication with the individual, any eligibility information. You would not want to put that in the synopsis because it's going to be lost over time. But if you put it in narration, it's permanent and it's also searchable. We can go down through time, backward through the calendar, and find the information that you have entered in narration. So please remember, the synopsis does not take the place of narration. OK, so once we get past synopsis, on the CAPS assessment tree, we will see the SPL and needs summary. So this is the first point in the CAPS assessment where we actually see the results of the CAPS assessment and the service priority level. In this particular example, you can see, and we've circled it here, that the service priority level is 3. And if we look below, there is a summary of what we have just done on the support screen by telling what need, what ADLs or IADLs the client is independent in and where they need assistance, and whether that assistance is just assistance or full assistance, and then whether that need is met and who is providing that need. This is a good summary page, and it gives you an idea of what you have covered and not covered. It's good for us maybe to glance through this because, for example, if we knew that our client had memory issues, but as we were looking at this, it says that memory is independent, then we need to go back to the memory question and really more fully describe the needs that are there. And so this has kind of been a double check for us to make sure that we've covered all the bases and we have captured all the needs of the client in our assessment. After we have viewed this, we click on the next button in the lower right-hand corner to go to the next screen. But before we do that, I've included a slide here that is kind of a chart on all of the SPL levels that are in rule. This comes from the Oregon Administrative Rules, Chapter 411, 015010. And we can see that the person that we just looked at, that was SPL3, if we look on this chart, SPL3 says requires full assistance in mobility or cognition or eating. Now, for many of us who are doing OPI, and this depends upon your AAA and your AAA area, but uh, many AAAs will accept for OPI anyone who is SPL 18 or below. Some AAAs have moved that to SPL 15 or SPL 13. So be sure you know your area plan and you know the limits of your particular AAA. But this SPL chart might be something that you, you would want to print out and keep handy so that it will give you a full description of all the SPL levels. OK, let's move forward. The next screen before the SPL and needs summary is called the full benefit results screen. Now, there is a lot of information on this screen that is not pertinent to OPI uh, because this same exact assessment can be used for Title 19 assessments for Medicaid. And that's the reason for giving the assisted living facility rates and levels and the same for residential care facility or adult foster home. But the thing that does concern us for OPI is the right-hand column, which you see here, and we're going to take a look at that and its components. So the first thing that we see is it's broken up into ADLs and IADLs and also 24-hour availability. 
we do not use 24-hour availability for OPI. So we're just going to omit that area. But here under ADLs, in this example, we see that the ADL needs were under elimination, which is minimal assist, dressing and grooming, which is full assist, and mobility, which is full assist. And then the IEDLs, housekeeping is substantial assist, shopping is substantial, and transportation is substantial. Now each of these assist levels by rule corresponds with the number of hours that the rule gives for in-home assistance for this particular person. Here we see the column that details the hours and for el elimination minimal assist, it's going to be 10 hours a month. Dressing and grooming is full assist at 20 hours a month. And mobility is full assist at 25 hours a month. Now, we can tell right away that these hours, if we were to combine them, probably go beyond most AAA's limits for OPI. Some AAAs have a limit of 20 hours a month, some less than 20. And so if we were just to look at this example and only to look at the ADLs, we would see that there's 55 hours just in ADLs, but if our, if our AAA limit is 20, we're not going to be able to use all of these hours when we do service planning. Now, it's not our goal today in this training to look at service planning. That is a separate training which we're going to um, also do and have available on the State Unit on Aging website. But this gives you an example of how the assessment actually comes up with the number of hours that it does for the individual. Okay, so <clears throat> once we click Next after seeing the full benefit results, we're going to come to a window which will be a decision point for us. And we have a choice of either completing this assessment and going directly to the service plan and working on service planning, or simply to complete the assessment and leave it as it is and work on service planning later. We're not going to use the button that says go to state plan personal care because obviously we're not doing a state plan personal care assessment. We're doing an OPI assessment. Now, those of you who were familiar with the previous decision point window, you can see that we have a new statement that has been added to it. It happens to be right here, and that statement says, I acknowledge that the assessment, treatments, and comments are complete and accurate. And in addition to pressing one or two of these buttons, we will need to check mark the box to say that our assessment is accurate before we hit the next button. Now, here in this example, I have highlighted the assessment complete. I want to go to service plan. The next thing, or we could do assessment complete, but we need to address this I acknowledge statement uh, before we go on and uh, click next. The reason that this is here is because of the new copy and create feature. So if we're going to copy an assessment, and then use that copied assessment and go through every ADL and IADL to make sure that our client still fits those descriptions, change any comments or answers that we need to change, and then finalize the assessment. This step simply is a way of verifying that you have looked at all the information and that you haven't just copied and then gone forward without actually reviewing what you have copied. So it's a safeguard. So once you do 
click the checkbox and say next, you're going to get a warning window which says you're about to set the status of this assessment to complete. No answers or comments may be changed after completing the assessment. Are you sure you want to complete the assessment at this time? We'll say yes and then go forward in completing the assessment. Now remember, the warning is true and accurate. Once we've completed this assessment, we can't go back and change any answers. So we are going to click the button yes, and what that will do is change our assessment from pending status to complete. Now, when an assessment is in pending, you can leave it. You can even close down the assessment, go on to other work, and come back to it and change as many things as you want to as long as the assessment is in pending. But once you have placed this pending assessment into complete status, you will not be able to go back in and change any answers. Now there are two other possible descriptions for a CAPS assessment. If we leave a CAPS assessment in pending and we don't finish it, then in 60 days the assessment is going to default to incomplete status. That is, we left it in pending too long, nothing, no activity happened, and now it's going to be an incomplete status. You will not be able to work with an assessment that's an incomplete status because it will lock down the assessment as incomplete. Also, if a CAPS com assessment remains in complete status, but you haven't done a service benefit or any service planning with that assessment, it will become invalid after 90 days. And the CAPS assessment will, instead of saying complete, it will say invalid. You cannot work with an invalid assessment, and you cannot build a service benefit or a service plan on an invalid assessment. You will most likely need to do another assessment in order to do service planning and to give a person an OPI benefit. Now there is a possibility of Tier 2 staff, that is usually local office managers or supervisors, to be able to override the status of an assessment and move it back into pending. So I leave this slide for you to study. Please note, for example, if you have an incomplete assessment, it is possible for an office manager to move it back into pending, which means then you can be able to make changes and work with it. But office managers and supervisors have certain rules as to when they should or should not move an assessment back into pending. And we probably would not move an assessment back into pending that is more than 30 days old because it is not a current assessment. So if we want to take a three-month-old invalid or incomplete assessment and move it back into pending or complete, that's probably not a wise thing to do because the assessment is three months old and may not be accurate. So in that case, we may want to do another assessment or even use the Copy and Create feature to uh, come up with another assessment that is more current. Okay, I have placed here for you a slide that would be very helpful if you could uh, print it out and keep it with you when you're doing CAPS assessment. These assessment or assistance, excuse me, assistant types are found in the Oregon Administrative Rules. And let me just show you very briefly how to use this chart. So for example, if we're looking at ADLs and we look at ambulation and transfers, the Oregon Administrative Rules only allow for hands-on assistance for ambulation or transfers. 
So if somebody is giving queuing, that is an assist, but it's not an assist level that is recognized by the Oregon administrative rules. So for example, there are many elderly people who have poor vision, and someone needs to cue them when there's a curb or a step. If all they're doing is cueing them, the person is not going to be an assistant ambulation because it's not hands-on assistance. On the other hand, if the person does provide hands-on assistance in addition to queuing, then it does meet the rule for an assist in ambulation because there has been some hands-on assistance. So please note that things like eating do include many assist levels, including hands-on setup, queuing, and monitoring. And many of the ADLs like bathing, hygiene, dressing, and grooming also consider standby assistance and queuing. So this is all based on the rules. And again, I would point you back to the long-term care rules to look at the activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living in the rules in order for you to know why the assist levels need to be the way they are on this chart. But I, I have found this helpful. I think you'll find it helpful. OK. We're going to just take a brief pause to let you know that we have completed the training on the CAPS assessment itself. But in this same module, we are going to cover client details. Now, client details is something that is required for OPI assessments and cases. But there's only one area of client details that we need to cover. So let's go into the client details training. This won't take us much time. So the OPI rules require only the diagnosis tab of client details be filled out. There are other tabs, and we're going to see them in a moment. But we have to list at least one diagnosis for every consumer that we're doing a CAPS assessment on. So in order for us to get to client details, we're going to use that little CAPS book icon on the access toolbar <coughs> Excuse me, that we use to get to the assessment. But as you can see, we have three choices. We have the assessment program, client details, and service planning. The arrow here is pointing to the client details button. We want to press on client details, and then on the button that says next. Once we do that, it's going to open a new window in client details. And we're going to see another tree over here on the left-hand side. Now, it's going to automatically open on medications. That's going to look a little bit strange to some of you who are maybe don't, haven't entered medications. We're not required to enter them, but you will deliberately have to take your mouse and point to diagnosis and click on it. And then the blue arrow is going to move from medications to diagnosis. Once you do that, it's going to open up the diagnosis screen. Now, the diagnosis screen allows us to search for different medical diagnosis. And we can do that a couple of ways. The client details screen will default to searching the diagnosis by name. Notice right here we have search on name. And that name button is highlighted. Now, in order to search by name, we would click on that button, and then in this diagnosis box, we would start typing in a diagnosis. Some diagnoses are very hard to find by typing them in, because maybe we don't know the correct medical terminology or name for that disease. Maybe we know the common name for the disease. And a prime example of that is COPD. Sometimes we know exactly what COPD is, but we 
we couldn't break down what each initial of that diagnosis actually means. And if we type in COPD in the diagnosis box, we're not going to come up with anything because that's not what it's listed as. But we could also search for a diagnosis using the code. So it's called the ICD-9 code, and for those of you who are really up on ICD uh, treatment codes, you will probably know that there's a new ICD, and it's uh, ICD-9 is the old one, but our system uses the old ICD-9 code. So we want to go back and just use ICD-9 list. And what we would do in order to search for a diagnosis is we would click on the code button. We would look up an ICD-9 list. Now, you have to do that separately. You won't find that in Access. You won't find that in CAPS. Now, the APD CM tool site does have a list of ICD-9 codes. You could also just Google it on the internet and find a list of ICD-9 codes. But if you had a list that was handy to you in searching for diagnosis, I think that it would be a valuable tool. In this case, we looked up COPD alphabetically on a list of ICD-9 codes and found out that it was code 428.0. So here we entered the number 428.0 and it immediately came up with, well, not, I'm sorry, we were not dealing with, with COPD any longer, but congestive heart failure and it comes up with congestive heart failure. This is the number for congestive heart failure. So. You can look up your diagnosis alphabetically, put in the number, it will find the diagnosis. Now, here's what to do in a pinch when we can't find the diagnosis by name and we don't have an ICD-9 list or we can't find one. Use the comment section down here below. You can type anything in the comment section and it will be a record that will stay here on the Diagnosis tab. It's not going to disappear when you close the tab. It will be there until you erase it or you change it. So many people put a diagnosis in the comment section. That is fine as long as somewhere on this Diagnosis tab we have at least one diagnosis for our client. Now, someone might have a question about the diagnosis themselves and whether we validate a diagnosis or require documentation of diagnosis. And for the purposes of OPI, we don't require documentation. And we don't try to verify with doctors or medical personnel whether the person has the diagnosis that they're telling us they have. We simply take the client for their word, and we ask them about their medical diagnosis. And a good way to ask that question is to ask if they're receiving medicine or treatments prescribed by a doctor, and if they are, what is being treated? What condition is being treated? And they'll probably give you a diagnosis. So. Sometimes their diagnosis is not in clear medical terminology, but they might tell you they have a chronic condition and describe that condition. That's something you can put in the comment section. And you can also say in the comment section that the client doesn't know the exact name of their diagnosis. Now, going on um, to the next slide, once you enter diagnoses, you can do more than one diagnosis. And as you do, they're going to be listed right here on the top portion of the diagnosis tab. In this example, we have three diagnoses, 
to congestive heart failure, incontinence of urine, and edema. Let's say that there was a diagnosis that was listed that is no longer a diagnosis for your individual, and you wanted to remove it. In order to remove a diagnosis, you would click on it, and that would highlight the diagnosis blue, just like we clicked on congestive heart failure in this example. And then you see the invalid entry button down here in the lower right-hand corner. You would click on that, and by clicking on invalid entry, it would remove congestive heart failure from the list of diagnoses. So that would make it an invalid entry. So now you know how to add diagnoses and how to remove diagnoses from client details. And so it's as simple as that when it comes to client details. You can close it down. There really isn't anything else that you need to do in client details, although there are many other tabs there. They're not anything that needs to concern us who are doing OPI assessments. So I hope you've gained some understanding today for both navigating the CAPS assessment tree and client details for OPI. Thank you very much for listening today. Thanks, Mark. Phew, that was lots and lots of information. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed hearing that, and I'm sure everyone else did too. I want to let people know that we uh, they can also listen to any of the other modules. We've recorded OPI basics and OPI forms and fees. This one is caps and client detail. And then the last one is service planning. So thanks again, Mark. And um, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.